You know, it's really interesting, just because we're about to get going, a, a small note about periodization. So most of these empires come up for the first time in Unit 3, the, the new Unit 3. Um, but they used to be Unit 3 and 4 were combined uh, into one big Unit 4. And that's usually when you got to see them the first time. So they used to kind of be interwoven with the, the European maritime empires. It was considered a kind of a contrast. It still sort of is, but uh, not being in the same unit now means they're kind of a little little separated. You're kind of expected to look at them as, as separate topics. But uh, just a small note about periodization and, uh, and where we're at uh, with the new course lineup. That said, I know a lot of teachers who do still teach them together, and that's uh, I think that's a good thing. As I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight, um, these empires really do, even if they're not uh, directly connected with events, say in the Atlantic or in Europe, uh, they still are, are part of a, a wider changing world uh, that's, that's happening around this time. So get into that. Okay. So let's see. Looks like we got some people who have covered these gunpowder empires already. Um, whoever that is, awesome. I might be uh, hoping you'll tune in, chime in uh, whenever we get going. So it's 8 o'clock now. We're going to go ahead and get started. I should say it's 8 o'clock Western time. I know if you're out in, uh, if you're out in the East Coast it's, or the Midwest, it um, could be a little bit cold so, or a little bit late. So, But it's about 8 o'clock here. Um, my name is Mr. Little. I haven't been here in a while. Um, been off, off not streaming, but now I'm back and, and ready to get talking. So, uh, a quick note: It looks like so two, so a couple of you have already talked about uh, the Gunpowder Empires, and I want to just throw out there that there's a lot to discuss about these empires, and we can't in a single hour. Uh, we can't get to everything. So, if you have a question or your teacher said something, and you really you really want to know like, more about that thing, or you want to ask questions about that thing, um, do go go throw that in the chat, and I'm sure we can find, uh, we can find some time to talk about it. Um, that's what we're here for. We're here to help you. Um, so if you have a question, if your teacher said something, and you'd like some clarification, uh, don't, don't be afraid. Throw it in there. Throw it out there. Um, I'll do my best to help you understand that a little bit better. But anyways, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as always, think Fiveable. You can feel free to follow us on Twitter, follow us on Instagram, follow us on YouTube. Uh, but we're here to help you. Um, you know, I'm a as a streamer. I also stay abreast of things. I, you know, follow Fiveable. I watch my fellow streamers. They do amazing work. Uh, so today in the stream, we're gonna just kind of talk a little bit about the basics of comparison. Just kind of brief review of how this is a historical thinking skill. We're going to talk a little bit about the basics of the gunpowder empires. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about their military technology, a little bit more in detail. And then we're going to talk about their administrative systems. And then we're going to have two um, sort of SAQ style document practices. And so when we get to that point, that'll be a good opportunity for you to go ahead and get active and chat. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, religious politics in these empires, as well as architecture and art. And then we'll kind of wrap it on up. If there's any, if there are any teachers in the stream, we've got some, I got some ideas of uh, ways you could address this in your class, ways I've addressed this in my class uh, that I'd love to share with you. So stick around to the end, and uh, we can talk about that. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, if you're just joining us, do feel free, uh, do fill out that poll, do fill out the two poll questions, so we kind of know where everybody is. Um, <clears throat> have you covered this topic already, um, and/or what grade are you in? So go ahead and fill those out just so I know where we're at in this stream right now. Um, so let's, real quick, let's review comparison. So one of the historical reasoning uh, skills is, is sorry, they're called historical reasoning processes, and there are three of them. Um, there used to be four, now there are only three. It's called, but, but the first one is called comparison. And this is essentially uh, what it sounds like. It's comparing two things, uh, two different events or two different developments. Uh, historical events or historical developments or historical processes uh, in the same general time period. Um, and so when it talks about, when you talk about doing historical comparison, you're, you're looking at the what and the why, um, but you're also 
making a judgment, historical judgment on what are the most relevant and significant uh, similarities or differences. And so this, again, that sounds tough. People are like, oh, Mr. Little, what do you mean like making a historical judgment? What do you, and it sounds scary. It's kind of like making a judgment. No, it's not. Believe it or not, you do this when you write an SAQ, you do this when you write a paper. By nature of uh, doing those papers, you're making a judgment. So it may sound a little scary, but it's actually not that difficult. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna be looking a little bit uh, side by side, putting some stuff side by side, uh, specifically these gunpowder empires. So that's just a real quick overview of comparison. Um, so these Islamic gunpowder empires, along with the other gunpowder empires, um, are a big part of unit three. And in particular, these two themes of unit three, uh, cultural developments, as well as governance, um, these particular sub subsections of these units uh, are what apply to the, to the gunpowder empires. So for example, we're gonna talk a little bit today about how the rivalry between two of the bigger gunpowder empires, uh, the Safavids and the Ottomans, intensified the Sunni-Shia split. So that's one of the things that the AP World College, the College Board wants you to be familiar with. They want you to be able to identify how these two empires intensified an existing uh, split between two religious groups. Uh, and then pretty much the rest of the thing, the rest of the material that you need to be familiar with, it pretty much falls under kind of a, a government umbrella, a government category. So you need to be able to describe and explain the, the bureaucratic elites and military professionals of each of these empires, how each of these empires used religious ideas, art, and monumental architecture, as well as uh, how they established effective tax collection systems to generate revenue. And we're going to go over all these things today, so hopefully by the end of this presentation and at the end of the stream, you could actually apply um, knowledge from here to all of these and you would be able to answer a question uh, if you saw them. So that's just kind of an overview. Uh, are there any questions before we get going? And of course, going forward, if you have any questions, you can always feel free to throw them up in chat. Uh, even if I'm talking mid-sentence, just go ahead and throw it in there and I'll check it as soon as I can. Okay, then let's go ahead and uh, let's get underway. So real quick, I'm going to give you a background on what gunpowder empires in general look like. Um, so we're going to go quick over a few features that are common amongst all of the states that historians typically call gunpowder empires. Now, just out of curiosity, um, what do you think might be one prominent feature of a state uh, that's referred to as a gunpowder empire? Just throw that out in chat. I'm, I'm sure we could think of at least one thing that is a prominent feature of a state referred to as a gunpowder empire. Sonny says, used gunpowder. Yep, nope, that is definitely one of the big, <laughs> it's a big prominent feature of the gunpowder empires. And yes, that's the one I was going for. I mean, you know, it's just kind of in the, um, kind of in the name. So that's, that's what I was going for. Uh, Judy says, a great deal of warfare. That is actually also true. Um, the use of gunpowder, they kind of go hand in hand, right? The use of gunpowder um, to further state expansion. So these are usually large centralized authorities uh, in land-based empires. Uh, and I say usually land-based because the Ottoman Empire is an interesting example of an empire that is land-based but also has a significant naval presence. Um, the utilization and prioritization of gunpowder for territorial expansion. So that kind of is what goes hand in hand, the use of gunpowder, but also the use of gunpowder to expand territorially. Uh, the use of gunpowder to expand your domains or expand your dominions. Uh, and then the third um, feature of these empires is administrative systems that can amass wealth to support gunpowder forces because at this time in human history, gunpowder weapons require an unbelievable amount of money and wealth to maintain. Uh, this is, this is pre-industrial revolution. This is pre-automation uh, or at least what we would call replaceable parts. 
um, which is something that actually comes up in AP US history too. Uh, back then, you have to understand, guns had to be built by hand. Every single one had to be built by hand by a skilled craftsperson. So guns were very, very expensive. And so any empire that was going to rely on them needed to have a super effective administrative system to gather all that wealth. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, all right. So here are the commonly accepted gunpowder empires and or some that historians debate um, as to whether they qualify as gunpowder empires. So for example, the Islamic gunpowder empires, which you can see spreading across India, Persia, and the Middle East, and North Africa. Those are the three we're gonna talk about today. Um, but two other big gunpowder empires include the state of Songhai in West Africa, as well as the Qing dynasty in China. Um, and some scholars have been known to include Russia in this category uh, of a state that utilized gunpowder weapons. Um, but some scholars uh, debate this because Russia's firearm industry was not developed until much later. And for much of its history, Russia did not manufacture its own firearms until very late in the game. Uh, so this is sometimes debated by scholars as to whether Russia kind of really counts as one of the gunpowder empires. Uh, the other one is Japan, which some scholars also question as to whether it was a gunpowder empire, mainly because uh, Japan did not embark on imperial expeditions in the sense that they never managed to establish an, an empire outside of Japan. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Japanese effort to conquer Korea. Um, and this is why some scholars do, in fact, put them in the gunpowder empire category, because they made an effort to build an empire. But others would say, since this effort didn't really go anywhere, um, that they would not fall in that category. So it's a little bit of a debate. But um, there are other gunpowder empires. The three Islamic ones are the most well-known, but they're not the only ones by far. And if you look at that map, you kind of notice it's it's most of a uh, good part of Eurasia, uh, Afro-Eurasia, uh, is kind of surrounded by these states, these large land-based states um, that use gunpowder to expand their territories. So this is just some stuff about gunpowder empires. And I want to talk quick um, before we start to dive into these Islamic gunpowder empires, each one specifically. I want to talk a little bit about their specific contexts. Uh, Sunny says, is the Qing, is Qing China the same as the Manchu? Yes, yes. Um, Qing, I, maybe this is a strictly English word, word we use in English academic literature, but uh, the Qing dynasty is the Manchu dynasty. Um, 16, 1644. Uh, the Emperor Kangxi, um, the Manchu people who came from up by the border with Korea. Um, it's, it's actually interesting. In, in, the, in my kind of American academic lingo, we say Manchuria as that entire region. Um, but in China, that province is actually three different provinces. So it's not, um, they wouldn't say Manchuria per se. If you, if you went to China and you said Manchuria, they would, might look at you confused. But if you said Harbin, um, which is the big city up there, then they might know what you're talking about. So it's a good question. Uh, but yeah, the Qing dynasty is this is the Manchu dynasty. Um, sorry, where was, okay, right, sorry. We're gonna talk specifically about the Islamic gunpowder empires. So one thing that I noticed over the last couple of years is my students sometimes would get confused and they might mix up some of these gunpowder empires with previous Islamic empires. And so I want to quick point out a few things that make these empires different uh, from other Islamic states that we've seen before, such as the Abbasid Caliphate or um, perhaps the Sultan of Delhi, just kind of what makes these empires a little bit different. Um, so one thing to note about these empires is that they're all nomadic in origin. Uh, so the Ottomans were originally Turkic, so were the Mughals, they were from what is now Uzbekistan. Uh, and the Safavids in Persia uh, are believed to have had Kurdish origins. And they were originally Kurdish. Um, so these, these empires all began as nomadic ventures, uh, not unlike the earlier Turkic migrations, such as the ones that created the Delhi Sultanate. Um, these empires are also a little bit different in their titles. Um, so for example, the, the, the ruler of the Ottoman Empire is referred to as the Sultan. The ruler of the Safavid Empire is referred to as the Shah. And the ruler of the Mughal Empire is uh, sometimes referred to as emperor, also sometimes referred to as Nizara, uh, which is a term, of, uh, it's a term of respect. Now, you might have noticed, or you might know, 
uh, that none of these titles are necessarily religious. Um, these are, in fact, all secular political titles. They don't necessarily embody any religious connotation. They're not like the caliph, which you might remember from Unit 1, uh, the, the Abbasid Caliphate, where the caliph is, in fact, the leader of the entire Islamic community. These empires um, don't necessarily have claims to universal authority. doesn't mean they won't use it, and we will talk about that. But just to be clear, these are um, a new chapter in the history of Islamic empires. So, last thing I want to note about them is that these empires are part of what we would call a Turco-Persian culture. Now, what this essentially means is that these empires combined two elements. They combined Islamic at large, but Persian specifically court culture and language. Even though only one of the three empires was in Persia proper, uh, all three empires used Persian as a court language, an official court language. Uh, so they took this particular culture and, and court culture, and then they combined it with some Turkic nomadic cultural elements. And so what does that mean? Well, so for example, you might read in your textbook that in these empires, uh, a sultan might kill uh, some of his children, some of his successors. They, they might have many sons, but they might kill some of them. Uh, to prevent a power struggle, uh, or that there might in fact be a power struggle. If the sultan dies and he has three children, they might fight each other for the throne. Uh, this is something that comes out of nomadic culture, and you might remember this um, from earlier discussions about like the Mongols and how nomadic tribes tend to be a more meritocratic society where you don't necessarily get anything inherited. Uh, you have to prove yourself. And so this is something that these empires were both blessed with and I would argue cursed with as well. Um, in the sense that you, you do see a lot of succession struggles throughout the course of these empires. Uh, you know, princes fighting each other after their parents die to try to gain the power. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as we go forward. So there's some very specific things for this empire. Um, and one last thing that I want to make a kind of a really big, big point about is these empires also represented what we would call, what I would what I refer to as the end of the nomadic conquest cycle. So throughout AP world, um, we see, we have this cycle where you have nomads who are up in Central Asia, where I've kind of drawn a circle around here. And every couple centuries, they will come out of Central Asia on horseback and they will conquer or destroy the civilizations of Mesopotamia, the Mediterranean, Persia, Northern India. Uh, you might remember the Turkic migrations from Unit 1, in the old AP world of course, we used to talk about um, the, the Hunnic migrations. We would talk about the, um, the way back in the old Unit 1 in ancient eras. We talked about like, the, the, um, the Kassites who moved, came out of Central Asia and toppled Babylon. Um, but the East Gunpowder Empires really end that cycle. They break that cycle where nomads come out and they, they conquer and they establish new states. These Gunpowder Empires really break that cycle and kind of end the threat that nomads from Asia pose to the big landed states. And so this is a really big deal because now there's no more, th this cycle of nomads come out, they conquer, then they get assimilated and they start a new state. And then another group of nomads comes out and conquers. This is now broken. This kind of historic cycle is now broken. And so partially because these states are large and gunpowder weapons help them repulse the, the, the horse riding and archery using nomads from Central Asia. So they're breaking this historical cycle, which is something really cool. Like, it's important to understand um, why these empires are so noted, noted in history. All right, any questions going forward? Now we're gonna go get into like the nitty gritty, talk about some very specific things from each empire. Oh, Tan joined us. That's good, Tan. Okay, if there's no questions, then we're going to go ahead and uh, dive right into the nitty gritty. Here are some vocabulary words. If you're if you're taking notes, I would recommend um, these are words you want to be familiar with, uh, specifically as it applies to military uh, structures or administration for these three empires. Um, you might be familiar with some of these words already, such as uh, devshirme, which is an Ottoman system of military and bureaucratic recruitment. 
you might be familiar with Janissaries, who were the, the product of the Dev Shermay system. Uh, you might have heard of the Zamindars, who were the tax collectors in the Mughal Empire, or possibly the Millet system, which was the a system in the Ottoman Empire that allowed people of different religions uh, to follow their own religious laws uh, in dealing with local affairs. So this is just some vocabulary that if you know, you're taking notes at home, I just in general, um, I would recommend becoming familiar with. Um, Eric has pointed out in chat that all of these are good evidence for free response questions or essays. Um, and that is very true. Uh, you know, I'm not sure about your teachers, but I tend to be somewhat little hard on my students um, demanding to know, that, demanding that they know uh, specific terms to use as evidence. So if your teacher is the same way, uh, these would be good terms to be familiar with. So we'll have another round of this kind of vocabulary a little bit later on. So, so let's talk a little bit about military power. And so what you need to understand is that all of these empires, the Safavids, the Mughals, and the Ottomans, um, they all had some sort of elite military unit. Uh, and each one was a little bit different. Uh, in the Ottoman Empire, they have what's called the Janissary Corps, which was a corps of soldiers recruited from the non-Muslim populations of the empire who were brought up from birth and they were trained uh, to be effective soldiers. Uh, and even though they were usually uh, Christians, they did convert to Islam upon their training. So, uh, but they were the crack core of the Ottoman Empire that allowed it to expand very quickly. In the Safavid Empire, you have a group of people, and this is the kind of Anglo-sized spelling, it's usually spelled with Q, uh, they're called the Kizarbash, and they were the fanatic followers of the Safavid state Shia religion, known as Twelver Shiism, that I'm going to talk a little bit about later. Um, but they were uh, devout soldiers who saw, sort of saw themselves as uh, warriors for that particular branch of Islam, and they followed the founder of the Safavid dynasty, Ismaili, and his successors, uh, and they also became a very uh, powerful force in the Safavid empire. Uh, also, I should note that all three of these uh, elite forces were noted for using gunpowder. Again, we, we're going back to the fact that these are gunpowder empires, and that the Janissary Corps became expert at firearms as well as expert with cannons. Same with the Kizilbosh, although they were a little bit slower to adapt. Um, but the Zamindars, in addition to being tax collectors, uh, were also uh, elite soldiers. They were rulers of fortresses who could summon uh, their followers together very quickly and assist the Mughal Emperor in battle. Uh, and so these were very effective um, fighting forces for each of these empires. And so one thing they all had in common uh, is that they all had some sort of elite uh, fighting corps uh, that was proficient in the use of firearms that made it possible for these empires to expand very quickly. Um, this is right here is actually a painting of a Janissary. Janissaries are noted for this amazing hat that they would wear with a white sort of cap. Um, makes them very noticeable. And this Janissary in particular is uh, wearing a cape made of a leopard, so that's pretty gosh darn. That's why I like this photo. It's very cool. Um, and the key to these these military forces, what made them so strong and powerful was that they possessed absolute loyalty to the ruler. Um, the Dev Shermay Janissaries are, what makes them so so powerful was that they owed everything to the Sultan. They were recruited as poor, farm, many of them poor farm boys, brought up, trained, educated by the Sultan. And because they weren't allowed to have children, were not allowed to have families, were not allowed to, um, uh, pass down their property to their to their parents, um, they pretty much owed everything to the Sultan, and so they were loyal to the Sultan, very fanatically. Uh, same thing with the Kizilbosh in, in the Safavid Empire. They um, believed, many of them believed that the Shah of the Safavids was semi-divine, some of them did to a certain extent, and so these were, were fanatical, devoted forces that helped expand these empires really quickly in their early days. Um, and, you know, they were specifically equipped with firearms, uh, such as this painting right here, which shows the Janissary reloading his musket. So I should stress that these forces were so effective, not just because they had firearms, but also because they possessed absolute loyalty uh, to the leaders of their respective states. But, as I said before, firearms are not cheap. Uh, and so in order to have a huge 
military core, uh, an elite, sometimes a good third of your army, um, using expensive firearms, you need to have a policy of taxation that's going to make it possible for you to uh, amass this sort of military. And so each of these empires was noted for its ability to quickly raise funds. Um, the particular point uh, that you AP world students should be familiar with, according to the college board uh, guidelines, is you need to be familiar with uh, itism or the Ottoman policy of tax farming, uh, which was a system by which the Sultan would grant a land, uh, a piece of land to a person, uh, usually a noble, a warrior, sometimes a Janissary. Uh, he would grant um, this piece of land to the Janissary and the Janissary would give the, the Sultan a, a set, a lump sum of, of cash or gold or booty or some sort of prize maybe. Uh, and in return, the Janissary got to uh, tax that land for all it was worth, which in the long run may have been a better deal for the Janissary, but in the short run uh, gave the Sultan and the state treasury a, uh, a great big boost of cash, which again allowed them to uh, quickly raise these large professionally well-equipped armies if they needed to. So, so each of these empires had a very particular system, and this is just kind of an overview. We're going to talk specifically about the Dev Shermay and the Nilet, and then we'll talk a little bit about the Zamindars and the Mughal Empire. I should note the Safavids, although they did not have a system that you need to be familiar with, much like nomads before them, the Safavids were really big on incorporating non-Persians into their administrative structure, even though they ruled over Persia, they incorporated um, Circassians from the Caucasus, other Kurds, um, and other groups in their empire that were not Persians. So, uh, let's really quick talk about the Ottoman Empire. So, the Dev Shermay system, as I've sort of already mentioned, is a system by which um, the ch children usually Christian, but, but not always Christian, sometimes Jewish, and really far later on in the history of the empire, uh, other Turkish children um, were recruited from a very young age, and they were taken to Constantinople, and they were trained to either be warriors, or they were trained to be uh, palace bureaucrats. They received a high education, uh, and they were paid very well and treated very well, and they owed everything uh, to the Sultan. And because they were not allowed to possess any uh, families that they could pass their belongings to. Once they died, everything went back to the Sultan. So you had sort of a rotating aristocracy that prevented the establishment of a power base that could threaten the Sultan. Now, as you might imagine, you know, that only works as long as you can continue to rotate your Janissaries through. What eventually starts to happen, and this is sort of in the future, but I'm gonna foreshadow it now, is you get a couple of not so strong Sultans who give the Janissaries the right to inherit their property and have children and pass down their title to their children. And that is one of the struggles that the Ottoman Empire is going to deal with in uh, Unit, unit uh, 5 and Unit 6 later on in the course. Um, what's interesting about the Ottomans though is they had another system, or it's a series of systems, but it was collectively called the Millet. And this system was essentially a form of religious autonomy by which the major religions of the empire were allowed to effectively govern themselves. Um, so, for example, if you were a Christian and you lived in a Christian village, um, then if you broke the law against another Christian, let's say you killed another Christian in your village, uh, you would be tried in a Christian court by a Christian judge, and the Christian judge would pass a Christian punishment, and that would be carried out. Um, the only exception to this rule was if you were a non-Muslim and you committed a crime against a Muslim, that you would be put in a Muslim court. But for the most part, all of the uh, major religious groups were allowed to fulfill, you know, follow their own laws. And this is sort of a map right here. Uh, it's in French, but you can, you can kind of figure out what it's saying. And this is kind of a map of all the, the major millets uh, or groups of people that were allowed to have their own rules, such the green is for the Muslims. Um, the light blue is for the Eastern Orthodox Christians. The kind of tan is for the Catholic Christians. Dark yellow, although you can't really see it. It's, it's a couple spots around here. Uh, those for Jewish. And then the, the purple is for the Armenian church. And so the Ottoman Empire, along with the, the Mughal Empire as well, had a, tol had a kind of policy of toleration. And they viewed this as the best way to keep the empire at peace was by letting all the religious communities conduct their own affairs, their own punishments, their own trials, 
And this, this system lasted pretty much until the end of the, the empire. Um, it's one of the things they are very well noted for. And this is something similar to the Mughal empires as well, we'll see. So in the Mughal empire, um, one of the things they did was they did their best to incorporate, um, they did their best to incorporate non-Muslims into this administration. So, for example, when the Mughals were Muslims from Uzbekistan, they conquered India. Um, they broke a deal with many of the local princes and said, hey, you can keep your power uh, as long as you're, you're loyal to us. And so Rajputs, which is a term for you know, North Indian princes, were allowed to keep their power uh, as long as they remain loyal to the Muslim Mughals. And some of them even got appointed to the positions of Zamindars, as I said before. Um, and so the Mughals also had a system of, of certain toleration um, that really helped their empire maintain itself. Part of the reason they did this um, is, is because they were, they were a tiny, teeny, teeny, tiny minority of Muslims ruling over a vast, really big population of non-Muslims. And so if they had tried to have a government of solely Muslims, that might not have worked out so well. Um, it's also worth noting that the Mughals also had a system of uh, provinces and, and um, that allowed them to easily uh, collect agricultural surpluses and taxes. It's called the Subha, um, which is an Arabic term. Uh, but the, Mong the Mughal Empire also had a, um, a system of administration. All right, any questions before we do a quick practice question? Anything I said that might not have been clear? Something your teacher said? Can I go back to the last slide? Yeah, sure, let's, uh, oops, no, last slide. That's all, perfect. Perfect. We'll just sit there for like one second. Uh, so, Shrutik asks, how were the Mughals and the Hindus able to coexist? Well, in keeping with this, um, as I said before, because the Mughals were such a tiny minority ruling over such a large non-Muslim majority, um, they knew that trying to force everyone to join Islam would probably not end well. Um, previous, you might remember um, from earlier units that um, other Muslim states, such as the Delhi Sultanate in India, were were not particularly stable, and they were they had a, an issue of trying to coexist with the Hindu population, and not always successfully. One way that the Mughals tried to sort of uh, not make their Hindu subjects angry uh, was to actually get rid of the jizya, which is the traditional tax that non-Muslims have to pay um, to exist uh, in a Muslim empire. Um, but the Mughals actually abolished this and did not force people to pay the jizya tax. So that's one way that they managed to coexist with one another. And jizya is, uh, I believe I'm gonna, it's on the screen in a later slide, but it's spelled J-I-Z-Y-A. It's a traditional tax. The Ottomans, did not abolish the jizya. They actually maintained it in addition to the Dev Shermay system. All right. So if there are no other questions, the, whoops, I'm going backwards. Okay. Then I'm going to give you these two pictures. I'm going to throw these two pictures up right here. Um, and so on the left, we have a picture of a Zamindar uh, from a 19th century uh, drawing. So a little bit after what we're talking about. Um, but still a drawing of Mughal Zamindars. And on the right, we have a group of uh, young boys lined up to be registered by a Dev Shermay recruiter. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm hoping maybe you can help me point out is um, what's the difference in the politics? What, what difference in terms of policies and politics of the Mughal Empire could we point out maybe by examining these, uh, examining these paintings. Um, oh, Eric has made the point that, um, yes, yeah, so Eric in chat is making a good point about the word Hindu, um, which I'm using in this presentation, but he's right in that this term Hindu is, is, a, is a term that did not exist at the time. Um, it's actually, 
some have identified it as it's, it's a word used by the English when they came to India to try to classify. It literally means south of the Indus. So it, it basically means everything south of modern day Pakistan. Um, and so that Eric is right. And we use this term retroactively, but it isn't necessarily the term uh, people would have used back then to describe themselves. Uh, but we use it today to try to kind of you know, bring together the series of beliefs uh, that incorporate the many gods that we call Hinduism now. But he's right. Some of you might remember if you talked about um, some of those South Asian states um, that that in South South Asia, what's now South India in particular, there were there were cults dedicated to individual uh, Hindu deities um, such as Shiva and Krishna. So the people might have identified with that a little bit stronger than they would have with um, the word Hindu. So I look at these pictures and I, I point out a few things. I would I would see a few things um, here when kind of looking at these images. I noticed that the this painting of the Zamindars, while it's not necessarily a painting by Zamindars themselves, of themselves, um, they do look they, they do appear to be very relaxed and they appear to be very comfortable. They're not really, you know, they don't look stressed out or bothered. They look like they're just chatting. Um, well, you know, this, this photo of the Dev Charmay recruits down here, they all, some of them look a little nervous. They look a little unsure. Um, maybe their parents are over here. It looks like they might be talking to an Ottoman official. Um, whereas this Dev Charmay recruiter, um, this, this gentleman sitting here on the high stool, um, looks, there's a definitely a difference in position. If you notice he's up here, they're down here, their parents are, are still below him. Um, you notice there's a big difference in positioning. Uh, this picture in general to me seems to be full of sort of pomp and formality. It looks very structured, right? Their recruits are here below the recruiter who's kind of examining them. Um, and then you have uh, this painting of the Zamindars, this drawing of the Zamindars. Everyone just comes very relaxed. And so if I had to use these two images to draw, to discuss differences between um, the Ottoman Empire and the Mughal Empire in terms of their administration, if I had to compare the Zamindars to the Dev Shirme, um, I might say something like the following. Um, if I had to explain the differences, I might say something like the following. I might talk about how the Muslim Mughals were a minority over a large non-Muslim majority, um, whereas the Ottoman Empire was the majority within their empire, or the Ottoman Empire was a Mus majority Muslim empire. So I might point out that one of the differences is that in this picture over here, um, these Zamindars might not be, uh, they might not be Muslim. You can't really tell, but you could, you could theorize they might not be Muslim. And you could point out that um, this is an empire that is a Muslim minority empire. So they would have to recruit non-Muslims potentially to help run the government. Whereas in the Ottoman Empire, they could insist on all their government officials being Muslim because they were a Muslim majority empire. Um, you could also point out that because they needed, they, by they, I mean the Mughals needed to not upset their Muslim, non-Muslim subjects, um, they might not be able to do a Dev Shermay type system. Uh, where they could for, they could require that their their bureaucrats and their leaders convert to Islam, so they might not be able to do that. That's not to say that some uh, local princes didn't convert to Islam in the Mughal Empire, but it wasn't required. It wasn't a condition. Uh, it wasn't a condition of uh, of service. Um, and I might also point out that the Mughals, to a certain degree, were a little bit less centralized than the Ottomans. And they didn't necessarily build their own system. They relied on pre-existing local systems. Now they did do some administrative reorganization, but for the most part, um, local non-Muslim princes were allowed to keep their non-Muslim prince territory. Um, versus in the Ottoman Empire, many of the, the places that were conquered were dispossessed. Uh, the nobles were dispossessed. The commoners would just keep doing what they were doing. But, um, any thoughts here? Sonny says, I feel like the painting on the right shows the Ottoman subject were essentially lining up to be more of a contributor to the empire that had already taken them, that had already taken over them. Um, yes, I, I think you use that word contributor. I think that's an interesting word to use. Um, 
Um, and that's that's actually a good point. I, sh I should point out something that you, you might encounter when looking at evidence about the Deb Shermay system is that even though many Christian parents were, were more than happy to send their children to Constantinople because this was an opportunity um, you know, to live and work in the palace or be part of the elite military force. And if you didn't do that, then you might just be a farm boy the rest of your life. Um, this was not a universally loved system. And some people were very unhappy about it. There are some, there's the DBQ, out, I think it's from, I don't know how long ago it was, but it included a poem uh, by a Greek Orthodox priest kind of condemning the Sultan and saying, gosh, darn you for taking the youth away from their parents. And, you know, you, you've done a terrible thing here. So it's worth noting, I think Sonny's contribution of pointing out that um, perhaps the author of this painting uh, was pointing out how the the recruits are sort of just there to assert the em to assist the empire. And notice they are all wearing red. That was a traditional um, that was the traditional Dev Shermay recruit outfit uh, was red. And you know you can't really tell from this painting what the reaction of their parents might be or or their fellow villagers. Um, so you could make a case either way. Uh, but it's a very good contribution there. Okay, let's oops. Not sure which way we're going. Okay. Let's head on out to the next part. Uh, are there any additional questions before we, we keep on going? We're going to talk a little bit about art and a little bit about uh, religious policy. Okay. So here are a few more vocabulary words. Um, that apply to these empires. Um, so this word caliph, which you might already be familiar with, um, why it's important in this context though is because the Ottoman Sultan after the year 1517 was not only the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, he was also the caliph of the Islamic world, which is a title that he uh, adopted after he took it from the last caliph, who was kind of just hanging out in Egypt, being the caliph, but not really having any authority. Um, Twelver Shiism is a term that refers to the religion that was promoted by the Safavids in Persia. Um, and it's a very particular type of Shiism, um, but it is the most common type of Shiism in the world. So if you were to meet a Muslim who is a Shia, uh, odds are he would probably, he or she would probably be a Twelver Shia, even if they're not necessarily aware of any distinctions, just because it is the largest branch of Shiism in, in Islam. And last is the word mausoleum. And this is a, a mausoleum, you probably, you may already know what a mausoleum is, uh, but what's important in this context is that the Mughals, and this is one thing that the College Board needs you to know, is that the Mughals in India uh, were famous for their mausoleums. You might already know about the most famous one. It's the most famous building in India, and you could probably name it. I'm, someone can go ahead and throw it in the chat, but I'm, I'm guaranteeing it's, if you don't know anything about India, you definitely have seen this building somewhere. Um, it's the Taj Mahal. Yeah, it's the Taj Mahal. That's actually a tomb. It's a mausoleum. Uh, but it's it's not the only one, but it is the most famous one. So what they want you to know is that the Mughals were really big at building mausoleums. So let's really quick, I've sort of already touched on a lot of this, um, but that each empire was in sort of a different religious situation, where in the Ottoman Empire, you have a majority Muslim empire over mostly non-Muslim minorities. Um, in the Safavid Empire, you have a slightly different situation where you have a Shia Muslim minority ruling over a Sunni Muslim majority. And that would change over time. And I'll show you why in just a second. And in the Mughal Empire, you had uh, a Sunni minority ruling over many other non-Muslim uh, religions at the time. Uh, this painting, I, I want to draw your attention to this painting really quickly. This is somewhat of a famous painting. Um, this is the Mughal Emperor Akbar. This is the first He's the most, one of the more well-known emperors of the Mughal Empire. And he's holding a meeting at a place called the Ibad Khana, which was a, a separate building he built for himself. Uh, and he built this building because he wanted to have discussions about religion. Does anybody notice um, the people in this painting? If you look closely, you notice these two people on the far left here. Um, do you notice anything different about them? It kind of makes them stick out a little bit from the, the other people in the painting, the ones on the far left. So this is the emperor himself right here. He's kind of covered with a little, uh, he's got a little kind of, uh, uh, sitting on a couch with a little roof over him. And on the far left, there are two individuals. What kind of makes them stand out? Anyone right, can anyone kind of guess who they might be? Yeah. 
these are in fact uh, Jesuit priests, these are Christians. And so one of the things that the Emperor Akbar did at this place called the Ibad Khana that he built was he invited people of all different religions to come and debate and discuss and talk about, including Christians, Muslims, uh, Zoroastrians, Jains, um, and later on, some even early Sikh followers would come and discuss at the Ibad Khan with him. So I want to quick show you this picture. This is a map. Uh, this is the distribution of Muslims throughout the world. Uh, and it's two shades of green. And I want to show you this because the dark green represents Shia Muslims. And if you look at this map, you'll notice that the largest concentration of Shia Muslims is in the nation of Iran, right here. Almost the entire country has a large Shia Muslim population. Part of the reason that is, is that the, Shia, the, the Safavids promoted this Shiism. And initially, while there was a lot of resist resistance at first, over time, the Safavids did convert pretty much all of what's now Iran to Shia Islam. So that's their legacy. One of their legacies is the fact that Iran is now a Shia nation today. Even though there are also, as you can see, there are Shia communities throughout the Middle East, Iraq, parts of Afghanistan, parts of Yemen, uh, Syria and Turkey. Um, Iran is Iran being a Shia nation is the legacy of the Safavid Empire. Um, so really quick, uh, question in chat. Um, Drew is asking, can we assume the relationship between the Abrahamic religions was positive during this time period? Well, as a blanket statement, during the entire time period, were, were relations between Muslims, Christians, and Jews positive all the time? As a blanket statement, we would probably have to say no, but what's interesting is there are some very notable instances of, of cooperation and tolerance. And as a policy of some of these empires, uh, to be tolerant is especially interesting. And the reasons why the, you know, this tolerance is practiced, uh, was it because rulers like Akbar were genuinely curious and genuinely wanted everybody to coexist in peace? Or was it because um, he just, he was a realistic person and he knew that he was gonna have to tolerate his non-Muslim subjects in order to effectively rule an empire? Then the answer might be a little bit of both. So it's, as a blanket statement, no, it, there wasn't 100% peace during this time period, but there are some interesting instances of peace uh, during this time period. Um, so real quick on the Ottoman Empire. So after 1517, the Ottoman be Sultan becomes the Caliph of the Islamic world. So he officially takes that title. So all future Sultans until 1922, when it's abolished, take the title of Caliph. And that means that technically the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire is the protector of all Muslims. And we see this because he made a point of going to war with people that he thought were harming Muslims, like the Portuguese. Uh, which you're going to learn about in Unit 4 um, when they establish an Indian Ocean Empire, a sort of an Indian Ocean trading post empire. Uh, the Ottoman Sultan wages about, you know, a good hundred years, four or five different Sultans wage these wars against the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and while, if, while some historians looking at the data and the evidence have suspected that maybe there was economic motive uh, to get in on that good spice trade, the same reason the Portuguese were there, uh, a lot of historians have pointed out that officially his reason for getting involved was that he wanted to make sure that Indian Muslims traveling to Mecca were not being harassed by the Portuguese because he was the protector of the Muslim world. And so this was a title that the sultans took very seriously. And they probably took it the most seriously when they were fighting their arch rivals, the Safavids, who being Shia Muslims uh, were not very prone to acknowledging um, the authority of the caliph. Now, I don't want to go too deep because we're running out of time and this isn't all, this isn't a theology class, but um, Twelver Shiism, which is the religion that the Safavids promoted in, his, in Persia, has an element to it called the hidden imam. And what this means is um, there's kind of a really important imam or a teacher and hidden doesn't mean that he's dead. It just means that he's, he's, he's away. He's not on earth right now uh, and he'll return someday. But the idea is that the hidden imam uh, will, will, is like uh, someone who's very close to God. And so what, what the Safavid rulers tried to do was sort of position themselves as saying, hey, we're really close to the hidden imam, right? So the hidden imam is close to God, and we're really close to the hidden imam. And so they sort of tried to set themselves up as uh, another source of authority in the Islamic world, promoting this version of Shia Islam. Um, 
And again, they did manage to turn um, uh, Persia and modern-day Iran into a Shia country. And they were pretty much at war with the Ottomans nonstop for about 150 years. Uh, and on numerous occasions, the Shah of Iran, or the Shah of Persia, um, tried to get you know Shias in the Ottoman Empire to rise up, like, rise up, uh, we'll, we'll come protect you. And so the, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire was very uh, upset and afraid by this sort of turn of developments. All right, uh, we're going to keep going. Last thing I want to talk about, we're going to skip this, we're going to come back to this. Uh, I'm just trying to find, I'm going to talk about art real quick. Oops, sorry. Moving too fast. Because um, I want to cover this art and architecture part. It's really cool. Uh, we'll come back to this SIQ to practice. Um, so, each one of these empires was known for a kind of art or architecture that rulers used to solidify their authority. So, in the Ottoman Empire, the sultans were really happy and they were really big fans of what's called miniature paintings, which are, as they sound, miniature paintings that depict big events in history. Um, and so for the Ottoman Empire, uh, they tended to do miniatures that depicted the greatness of their rulers. And so one of the most well-known miniatures and one of the, the better miniatures is this miniature that talks that depicts a, a battle on an island called Rhodes in the Aegean Sea. And it shows Ottoman Janissaries attacking the walls of Rhodes. And so here you can see the brave Ottoman Janissaries with their weapons of, of uh, gunpowder attacking the Knights of St. John who are defending uh, the island of Rhodes. And so what can we take away from, from this particular miniature? Well, one of the first things to note is that the, the person who created this was not a Turk, was not, a, was not an Arab, was not someone who's traditionally Muslim. They were a Slavic convert to Islam from Bosnia, named Matraki Nashun. And that this battle is one of the defining battles of the early Ottoman Empire. When they beat the Knights of St. John at the Battle of Rhodes, they secured their hold on the Indian Ocean. Um, or sorry, not the Indian Ocean, my bad. The Aegean Sea, which is like the ocean between Turkey and Greece. So this Battle of Rhodes was a really big victory for them. And so this miniature was incredibly popular. The Ottomans would send this around the court so that they would know um, you know, remember that great victory we had over the Janissary, over the, the Knights of St. John on the island of Rhodes? Wasn't that great? So miniatures were one of the ways the Ottoman Empire tried to uh, reinforce its authority. The sultans tried to use their authority. Um, the, um, for the Shahs of Iran, they did something a little bit different. Shah Abbas I, who was the third ruler of the Safavid dynasty, built a brand new capital at a city called Isfahan. And this was one of the largest undertakings the Safavids ever did. And they built a couple of really big things. First off, they built a massive square called Nakhshijan Square. And they used this for state ceremonies, for polo games later on when polo became popular in the empire. Um, it was connected to the Shah's palace so he could walk out of his palace and look upon, uh, he could look upon this gigantic open square. Uh, it was connected to the large mosque that was also built near the square, and it was connected to the largest bazaar, bazaar being a market um, that the largest Iran had ever seen, Persia, I'm sorry, Persia had ever seen up to that point. It was two kilometers long. So the market itself was two kilometers long, and you can kind of see on this map that I've included here um, that this market runs for two kilometers throughout the city. The reason they did this was because they wanted to bring merchants to the city. This is not anything new. You've probably seen by this point in AP world um, that trade is something that empires want to promote. They want to control it. They want to tax it. It's part of their power. Um, Abbas also wanted to assert his religious authority. And to that end, he built a gigantic new mosque in Isfahan, which is called the Shah Mosque. Today, it's called the Iman Mosque. It's been renamed since the Islamic Revolution in 1979. Uh, but it was one of the largest mosques at the time. And in particular, the dome that was, and you can kind of see it in this photo, it's sort of in the corner. The dome that was used to build this mosque was similar to domes that previous uh, Iranian empires, uh, Persian empires had used. In particular, the Sasanians, which were the last non-Muslim Persian dynasty, built domes like this. And so the idea was, hey, look at me. I'm building domes just like the old Persian empires of old. I want you to associate me with the greatness of those empires. 
And last but not least, of course, we have the mausoleums of the Mughals. But we're not going to talk about the Taj Mahal. We're going to talk about the tomb of the second Mughal emperor, Humayun, built in 1569. And these are two photos of the tomb. Uh, this is found uh, outside of Delhi, I believe. And what's interesting about the tomb is that it reflects a blend of Persian and Indian influence. Uh, so, for example, the dome is a Persian-style dome. Uh, it's made of white marble, like the Persian domes would be. Um, and yet the dome is also surrounded by chatri, which are these uh, pavilions that you see kind of in the second photo. You can see these little pavilions. This is a very South Asian thing uh, to do. This is very uh, Indian, if you will, uh, style of art. And you can see kind of from the second photo, but a little bit more in detail uh, on the first photo, that there are many arches in this mausoleum, in this tomb. Uh, this is similar to the arches that would have been used at mosques. And so this tomb does two things. One, it asserts the religious piety of the ruler, because look, my tomb looks like a mosque. And the same thing with the Taj Mahal. It looks like a mosque. It has minarets. So there's sort of a, a, a piety element there to kind of assert their religious credentials as rulers, the Mughals. Um, but there's also sort of an effort by blending local architecture in with these Islamic uh, motifs to say, hey, look, we are we're legitimate. Like, we belong here. We are the rulers. Um, you know, maybe we're Muslims and maybe we speak Persian, but we are of this place, like you. Look, we use the art that you use. We use the material that you use. Uh, and so these, these mausoleums that the Mughals built um, served many purposes to try to sort of reinforce their authority in a place where, again, it's important to remember, they were a very small ruling minority over a large non-Muslim majority. So, okay, let's go back. Let's go back to that SNQ because I want to make sure we can take a look at this. Um, I just want to make sure we got the art in before we ran out of time. So we have a couple minutes left. So... This is an SAQ. We have we have a couple minutes left. And so what I'd like you guys to do if you could take if you have a few minutes to go ahead and read this. Now this is a letter sent from the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire to the first Shah of the Safavid Empire in 1514. And this is a very short version of the letter. Um, the, the full version is much longer, and I have linked it in the uh, I've linked it in the um, the resources for this video. Um, but this is a short version of the letter. And it reads as such. I, sovereign chief of the Ottomans, Salem, destroyer of the enemies of the true faith, I address myself graciously to you, Emir Ismaili, uh, chief of the Persia, troops of Persia. All right, I said Ismaili, it should be just Ismail. To you, Ismail, you have impaired the purity of the dogmas of Islam because you have dishonored the altars of the Lord and you have opened Muslims to the gates of tyranny. Open to Muslims the gates of tyranny and oppression. <clears throat> Our ulama, which is a term for uh, Islamic judges, have pronounced a sentence of death against you. Perjure and blasphemer, which is a perjure being a word for liar, blasphemer being a word for uh, someone who uh, someone who, who profanes against God or a religion. Uh, and have imposed the sacred obligation to destroy you, uh, to destroy your person, aka you, and that of all of your followers. What a lovely letter. What a nice, I'd love to get a letter like that, telling me that I have uh, blasphemed against my Lord and uh, <laughs> I need to be destroyed. So my question, once you read this letter, can you explain how this letter represents uh, the political rivalry between the Ottomans and the Safavids? And we're going to skip over to the next slide because I have made a few points here. Um, when I was reading this, I focused in on a few things. First off, I noticed that he mentions the, he calls the Shah by <clears throat> not, not a, a high title like Shah. First off, a low title of Emir, which is below a Sultan. So not his equal. Uh, and he calls him the chief of the troops of Persia. So not, again, not, not his equal and like perhaps just the lone commander. Um, and again, we, we have some religious language here, dishonor the altars of the Lord, uh, perjure, blasphemer. Uh, we're talking about religious judges and the sacred obligation to destroy your person and that of all your followers. 
So I noticed that not only is, is the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire talking down to the, to the Shah of Persia, um, but there's also, there's quite a bit of religious, um, so, so quite a bit of religious uh, overtone in this letter. And so I noticed that um, I, I came to, to two, kind of two conclusions that maybe this has to do with their religious rivalry, right? Uh, the Sultan being the Caliph of the Islamic world and the Shah of the Safavids being the leader of the Shia faction, uh, sort of of the world and kind of taking that title of hidden Imam, um, <clears throat> which again, this kind of true faith um, term that seems to come up, right? He is the Ottoman is the, the Ottoman Sultan is the, the destroyer of enemies of the true faith. And maybe by extension, Emir Ismail is not of the true faith. But I also thought about the context of this letter. And in 1514, both of these empires were, were heading up. They were on their way up. Um, <clears throat> if you remember, the Ottomans captured the capital of the Byzantines in 1453. So this is a time of growth and strength for both of these empires. This isn't like a decline. So perhaps this is simply a rivalry. This is a little, uh, this is a little flexing on someone else before it's too late. So this is what I thought when I kind of looked at this particular document. Again, if you'd like to read the full letter, it's actually a back and forth, back and there's like four or five letters. Uh, I have sent the link in the resources. If you'd like to look at the full exchange, that's uh, up to you. Okay, um, last but not least, thank you so much for bearing with me on all of this. Last but not least, if there are any teachers in the chat, I wanna go over um, a few ways that you can uh, work with the Islamic empires in your class. So one really simple way, if you have a short day or not a lot of time, is you can do the three-way diagram, <clears throat> the three-way Venn diagram, that's the three circles. Uh, just use your textbook, um, ask your students to get some keywords in there, and just have them compare side by side the three these three empires. The nice thing about there only being three. Um, you could also do an art show, as I made a point that art and architecture is a really big deal for these empires, so I have students do some research, have them make a little poster, throw up a gallery walk, <clears throat> and then uh, have them maybe present if you don't want to do a gallery walk. And last but not least, talk about the the contextualization of the time period of these empires after they fall in. Um, again, think about how their rise and their fall helped define this time period, 1450 to 1750. And if that's something that should be, or maybe, maybe shouldn't be, if your students think these empires are not chronologically significant enough to um, uh, to be a defining feature of the AP world. So have that debate, have that discussion. Okay, um, that's all. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Um, if you have any questions, I'll stick around for just a few more seconds, but thank you all for attending. Uh, I know it's late, so if you're on the East Coast, especially go to bed. Um, Sunny, thank you so much. Shurutik, thank you so much. I do check out those resources if you'd like to. Judy, thank you so much for coming. I hope y'all have a good night. Okay. Then we're going to call it time. Good night, and I hope to see you next time.